that if a pandemic doesn't make us react as a humans, as a society, and, and realize that institutions need to perform better. Uh, being a democracy is referred to how do you treat people, how do you really allow them to have access to opportunities, and, and to have a really open dialogue that combines health issues with the management of resources, with the labor market, with, with how democracy itself performs. From the perspective of, of a medical historian, I ha was of course aware, very much aware, that there had been a massive pandemic a hundred years ago, the influenza epidemic of 1918-19. And so there were a lot of things that I kind of expected to happen, but I also thought, and it turned out to be wrong, that because we have so much more medical technology now, that the death you know, the mortality wouldn't be so terrible. But in fact, um, in 1918-19, over 600,000 Americans died of the flu, which was the worst pandemic in history in this country since um, colonial times. But now we've hit over, well over 700,000. So that has been absolutely tragic. In many ways, that death rate could have been avoided. We could have avoided, you know, hundreds not hundreds of thousands of deaths if we'd had a better response. Sadly, I and a lot of other researchers in this area were not that surprised when we saw how the pandemic disproportionately hurt communities of color in the United States. Um, I'm not an oral historian myself, but I have used some of the interviews that were done by the NIU Oral History Project. So I guess it was around um, late spring that we started hearing reports that people were dying of COVID in disproportionate amounts based on their race. I imagine when the historians study the situation of human beings, um, you really can see the effect of social networks and internet and misinformation in a, in a health crisis and how institutions get short because the culture is just shocking. Bilingual Spanish-speaking healthcare workers were able to work with patients who were terrified but were able to be, you know, somewhat calmed down when they found somebody, a nurse or, or health worker, who could talk to them in their own language. And Latinx health workers, bilingual workers, were also really important in communicating with the families because, as you know, families were not allowed to visit because of infection, fears of infection, and so not only did families not have direct access to their loved ones in the hospital, but if there was a language barrier, that made it even more impossible. So many of the healthcare workers who were interviewed talked about how they used their Spanish skills to not only um, translate for the patients, but also for their families to make sure that, for example, they could um, you know, call in, FaceTime with their families. But it's really essential for there to be a diverse healthcare workforce, and especially for there to be lots of access, much more access than we have now, both to bilingual health workers, but and specifically to professional interpreters in hospitals and healthcare settings. My name is Alicia Cisneros and I am a dental assistant. Being a Latino myself, I know what people are going through. I know, um, the pain a lot of people are suffering. 
and uh, being uh, part of the Latino community, um, you know, it's, it helps me understand it more. It was very hard um, thinking that I can become infected and bring it to my uh, daughter, um, granddaughter. So in order to avoid that, we kept away from each other, you know, for a long time, for months. I didn't see them for months. We would just talk on the phone or do video calls. It was very scary working throughout those um, months because you didn't know or we didn't know if the people could have the virus. Um, and actually, that is how I think I got it myself. I think it's, it's, uh, it's one of the um, occupations that puts you in risk a lot. You know, working with patients that you don't know where they've been at uh, or who they might have come in contact with. And patients are working with their mouth open. So, I mean, or they're laying there with their mouth open and we're working on their mouth, you know, coming in touch with their saliva. Um, in particular in my family there were a lot of members affected by COVID so no one died but the consequences uh, remain in, in terms of the health, in terms of the, of the economy, in terms of the way that they relate to with people. So I have um, uh, some aunties that I really love, but it's impossible to see them because they are so scared they still don't want to go out. Members of my family that were able to get the vaccine eh, more or less have a normal life, but, and they have to go out and work. It's not, not all the people have the privilege to be working from home and continue getting a payment, getting a salary. In this part of the NIU Calp is like everyone is vaccinated, everyone is using the mask, and so you can move on. But in Colombia, there is a, a still a lot of a struggle with the pandemic. So that affected me mentally. I became really scared. I am not a person that normally is scared. I, like, I have feel in the United States fear, serious fear, like, Fear of the mass shootings, fear of the of the racism, fear of the of the pandemic. I contracted it in the middle of April, um, April fifteenth, actually. I had come into work for a couple of hours just to see a couple of emergencies, and as I was working, I started feeling a very weird body sensation I had never felt. Um, by the time I, and that went on for like three hours. By the time I got home, I was feeling extremely tired, very tired. So I went to bed and took a nap. When I woke up, I had a fever. Um, I got text, tested the next day and um, that was on a Tuesday. On a Friday, I was admitted to the hospital. It was, the most um, sick I've ever gotten. I've never felt like that in my whole life. Um, I honestly thought I was gonna die. It's very difficult to explain what it feels like, but it was, well, at least in my case, um, it was a very weird sensation in my body that I cannot describe how it felt, but it was like being in pain all over. I felt like I was, laying on top of a hot pan all, to, all the time. Um, I couldn't sleep. Um, I, um, I was in pain, but it was a weird pain. It was not like a muscle ache pain. It was like a, like a more inner pain coming from way in the inside that I couldn't figure out a good position to sleep. Um, couple of nights, I remember, at 12 o'clock at night, 2 o'clock in the morning, just crying to God, you know, help, to help me because I thought I was not going to make it to the next day. I ended up losing my mom and my little brother. Um, 
they contracted the virus in May. We kept away from each other in order to protect my mom. My mom got sick and um, she had a fever, she had a cough, but it was very hesitant to go to the hospital. She didn't want to go. Um, so actually she stayed home and um, I guess she went through the symptoms because at the end she only had a, a cough, a very hard cough that wouldn't go away. So my brother took her to the hospital to get checked. She was intubated for 12 days and then unfortunately didn't make it. In that uh, frame time, um, my little brother uh, had to get tested too because of being in contact with my mom and he came back positive, but wasn't having any symptoms. Um, he, <clears throat> All of a sudden, well, because he was the one that had brought my mom into the hospital, he was the one um, talking to the doctors and keeping us updated. One day I, I called him up because it was 10 o'clock in the morning and I hadn't heard from him. And he was very sick at that time. I could hardly understand what he was saying. So that was on a, on a Thursday. That Thursday night he went to the hospital and he died 30 minutes after he was in the emergency room. It's, it's been over a year now. Um, my brother passed away on May 22nd of 2020. Um, it was a very painful situation because uh, doctors had told us that my mom, most likely it was, she wasn't gonna make it, so that we, we should start getting prepared for the worst. And uh, we got all together on a phone uh, conference call on uh, Monday. Monday, uh, um, starting to plan my mom's funeral so that it wouldn't catch us by surprise when it happened. Ironically, that same week on, on Friday, we were paying the funeral expenses for my brother. That was on a Friday, May 22nd. Um, and then my mom died on Monday, on Labor Day of uh, 2020. Uh, we ended up doing their funeral at the same time. I'm glad that there are projects like the Latino Oral History Project. I'm very glad <laughs> because when I look back and try to study, you know, pandemics a hundred years ago, there's so little evidence about what happened to people who were not wealthy or white or in positions of power. So this work is really important just for the future, for historians and people to look back and understand how it affected different groups of people. Uh, but that's that still is not going to go far enough to remedy these problems, so we really need to tackle the structural inequalities in this country. Communities of color have higher rates of uninsurance, of not having health insurance, than other groups in the population. So lack of insurance means people were maybe less able to go get testing earlier on, they were less able to get care. Also a lot of Latinos and people of color work in jobs that don't provide health insurance. So many people of color are essential workers and they were put at risk because either they come in contact with the public or because of the, their working conditions such as working in factories or meatpacking plants where they have to work in very crowded conditions and early on with very little protection. 
people of color also tend to work in jobs that don't have benefits like paid medical leave. So if they got sick, they couldn't afford to stay home. And also communities of color are disproportionately affected by pre-existing conditions. <clears throat> so like diabetes that make COVID more dangerous for them. The risk for Latinos um, was also shaped by Latino family structures. So you had multiple, you have multiple generations living together in the same household, making it very difficult to, to quarantine and isolate once you've contracted the virus. There, then, then more family members get sick and, and all that sort of stuff. So you know it complicates, right? Um, um, you know healthcare and access and all that stuff. I thought that because we had more advanced technology and medical care than we did 100 years ago, that that would mean we could save a lot more lives, but that just hasn't been the case. Um, even though we have a vaccine now, and the medical technology and the expertise that went into developing the vaccines so quickly is absolutely amazing. In 1918, they didn't have a vaccine for the flu. But I never expected that we would have these advances, but that people would refuse them. I am fully vaccinated. Um, working uh, in the health field uh, was easier for me to get the vaccine um, because uh, working with patients um, and even if I wasn't working with patients, I would have tried to get it as soon as possible. The COVID-19 pandemic has, has I think, um, made these inequities and disparities much more apparent. Um, generally, um, oral histories um, have been really important for allowing individuals and communities whose, whose stories and whose experiences haven't been uh, documented previously in sort of more traditional um, archives as well. And so the NAU Latino Oral History Project is one of those projects that sort of does all of these things. It makes more visible the stories of Latinos, it engages the Latino community, it um, trains and mentors Latino students um, as researchers, and so I think all three of those things overlap to make this a really important project to um, distinguish, I think, the university from among other institutions, in, not just in this area, but really across the, the Midwest. My goal is to, to keep growing the project, building the project, and just increasing uh, the visibility of the project as much as we can. Striking across all of these different individuals and different experiences is really um, this theme of, of resiliency, this theme of uh, we're tired, um, this is hard, um, I cry sometimes after work, um, you know, my I'm, I'm worried, but we're going to get through it. You know, my, my family will support me, my community will support me. I know that I'm valuable, I know that I'm important and, and we'll get through it, we'll, we'll be back.